Zvezda TV Network presents. Few of us realize when we see the AD systems launching their missiles that should an aerial attack really happen, it will be our last line of defense, saving us on the ground from terrible death. This footage was shot in September 2020 in Nagorno-Karabakh. War is always devastating, but watching such videos is especially hard. You see these people, helpless to prevent it, and not even realizing that in a few seconds, they will be dead. In the past, the entrenched infantry knew at least where the attack might come from. The Allies were behind them, the enemies in front, and even when the threat came from above, they would be warned by aircraft engine roar and could try to take cover. Today, death glides silently from the skies. We won't judge today who was in the right and in the wrong in that war. What matters is how Russia is protected from such attacks, the attacks that may come even during peacetime. Remember the assassination attempt on the president of Venezuela or the attack on the oil refinery in Saudi Arabia. On such days as those, you feel that if there are angels living in heaven, then the people guarding them should count as their equals. And if the army is the ground forces, the air defense should be the heavenly forces. Air defense, the heavenly forces. The Igla and the Verba, the Pansir and the Tor, the Book and the Viking, the Vityaz and the Triumph. We've already seen some of them individually. Today, we'll show them working together as a team combating the U.S. Tomahawk and Minutemen, Turkish Bayraktar and Israeli Harab, as well as homemade drones and gas cylinder rockets. Could an ADMS even bring down a ballistic missile? All of this right now on Combat Approved. Combat Approved. August 2020, Russia, Astrakhan Oblast, the Ashluk Range. Not many knew that the largest air defense military exercise of the year took place here. The ADMS don't often get the chance to show their firepower on such a large scale or against such a variety of targets. And their performance was closely observed on huge widescreens at the Patriot Park by military attaches and other experts. Combat Approved was granted unique permission to mount action cameras right in the thick of the action, and we got some spectacular shots. The military, of course, were not aware of these cameras. For them, it was a serious military exercise simulating a full-scale attack. Their vehicles, covered in camouflage nets, from a bird's eye view look practically indistinguishable from the environment. And so it begins. The heavy hitters, the S-300 and 400, deploy for battle. Farther afield, the book, including the latest M3 version. Next to those, the masters of close-range combat, the Pantsir S-1 ADMGS. As we said, today all these systems will be working in cooperation. This means that during the first stage of the engagement, all of them will receive target designations from the same control post. This is the radar complex of the S-400 Triumph. It monitors the airspace, detects targets, and assigns target designations to ADM battalions. It can detect any existing targets, from ballistic missiles to small-sized, high-speed, low-altitude targets. First mission, defense against test missiles. This is how it would look in one of the test scenarios. An enemy with an air force and a navy prepares not just a single airstrike, but a full-scale missile storm. As soon as the missiles are launched, the whole radar system gets into high gear.
the command post immediately joins in. The operators look almost like pianists playing four hands. They have to make decisions on the spot. There's more than one missile coming. It's a full-scale missile offensive. And so the Astrakhan steps explode with the war of the S-400 launches, the very same S-400 that the NATO ally Turkey chose to purchase from Russia. The very fact speaks for itself. The first launch is followed closely by the second, double tapping, as the hunters say. Then the whole battery starts firing, all three launchers. In a couple of minutes, five missiles are in the air, and another S-400 is firing nearby. A full-scale attack scenario continues. A couple of cruise missiles and aircraft sneak past the first air defense layer. However, they will now have to deal with the upgraded book. The first book detects and identifies the targets, then starts calculating the flight path for the missiles. Here we see the illumination and guidance radar deploying for operation. Its primary objective is to detect low-flying targets. It works in conjunction with the launchers. Its antenna is deployed at 80 feet and can work in different modes and search sectors. The red dots on the screen is the enemy, coming nearer and nearer. But the operator is patient as a sniper. He's calm and collected, and presses launch only at the right moment. The book fires once, then twice, and it's over. The target is eliminated in a few seconds. We saw a similar aerial hunt a month later at the Kapustin Yar range nearby, during the September Kavkaz 2020 strategic military exercise. As soon as the Supreme Commander-in-Chief and the Minister of Defense arrived, the ADMS started exercise launches. The enemy sent a barrage of crews and ballistic missiles on their positions. But as before, they were met by the S-400 and the book. Look at the sky. There's a large group of clouds, but among them, this small one, and the second one. Those are the traces of the missile hits. The ground phase of the exercise will soon be starting. But before that, we'll see the Pansir, the Tor, and the latest Tunguska. This place will be familiar to those who closely follow military news in the country. During the Kavkaz 2020 exercise, here was the command post of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. He, the Minister of Defense, and the Chief of General Staff all worked from here. But in fact, this place is most closely associated with the air defense troops of the ground forces. Please meet the head of the center. What is the official name of this center? I am the head of the 167th Training Center for the Combat Application of the Air Defense Troops of the Ground Forces. So this is, in fact, your command post? This is the command post of the training center. And what's the main purpose of this command post? Or maybe more broadly, of this center? Conducting air defense exercises, ranging from joint military exercises to individual battery or platoon exercises. We should note here that there are two different branches of air defense in Russia. The tactical air defense troops, who are part of the ground forces, and the aerospace defense forces of the aerospace forces. The former provide protection to troops in combat or on the march. The latter, on round-the-clock duty even during peacetime, protect strategically important industrial areas, nuclear power plants, cities, and of course, the borders. Their different missions are reflected in their armaments. The S-400 Triumph and the S-350 are in service with the ADF, 
You also have the previous generation S300 systems. But the tracked S300 V4 are in service with the ADT. They also have the Tor and Tunguska and the Igla and Verba Manpads, and of course the book. But why of all the AD systems do we highlight the book? Well, first, we've already talked about the Tor, Tunguska, Igla, and Verba on previous episodes of Combat Approved. And second, the day we filmed at the ADT Training Center, launch the target drone, register, target drones on course. They were working with the book. So for the time being, let's focus on the book. We have here 16 Book M2 missiles. Not all 16 will be launched today, but we'll see at least a couple in the air. What can these target? Well, they can hit enemy aircraft with ease, enemy cruise missiles with ease, but even more impressively, they can bring down a ballistic missile too. The fact that these ADM, not ABM, systems can intercept ballistic missiles proves that this system is on a whole different level from the competition. The cranes loaded the 16 missiles and a special 17th. We'll talk about this one later. First, let's meet the vehicles in the system. We're seeing a book battalion on the march, the column of 12 vehicles. Let's talk about battalion composition. This is the battalion commander. The first vehicle is... This was the command post vehicle for directing fire. This is the target acquisition radar, the eyes and ears of the group, assigning target designations to the launchers. And here's the launcher that's going to fire the new missile today. And finally, the main event. The Talar carrying the 9M317N missile. We called it the main event because this vehicle today will be launching the latest missile for this system, the one we saw earlier, the 17th. This vehicle is very interesting. At first, we thought it was a crane, but in reality, it's... The illumination and guidance radar. Raised to 80 feet, it will detect low-altitude targets. 80 feet. It's almost like an eight-story building. And the last vehicle is... The Tell. The Book M3 system is designed as a replacement for the previous M2 version. Seems like a small change. The number two is replaced by the three. But there's a huge difference. Simply put, they are different generation systems. The first change is the number of missiles. Each M3 Telar carries six of them, in place of the M2's four. And the second and most important change is the new computer brains of the system. Take a look around this Book M3 Telar vehicle. No doors, no windows. Lots of hatches, but these house the sensors. The main hatch is here, in the front. Let's knock on the driver's hatch. Now let's open the commander's hatch and try to get in. Careful not to bump against anything. That's why the crew always wear helmets, by the way. Let's get to the blast-proof seat. We'll open this hatch, too. Let's show this beauty with her eyes open. Inside, there's a lot of electronics. And still, there's more room than in the M2. The new book's interior, divided into sections, looks like a submarine. 
And now for the actual equipment. This is the commander's monitor, the master operators and the operators. This is the commander, we'll meet him properly later. Behind him is the cold storage compartment. Below us is the emergency hatch. But the main attraction here is, of course, the control panel. We're wondering what's new here. The system is capable of simultaneously tracking and firing on six targets, but we can actually track 12. Wait, but how is that possible? There are two operators plus you, and you three track 12 targets? Absolutely. Each of us has a TAR monitor. So as soon as the target is acquired, they switch to the auto-tracking mode, and I can see them on my monitor. So they can start working on the next ones. So the vehicle is ready to fire. But we must first reach our primary position. This test drive we decided to make into an extreme one. The gearbox is an automatic, three forward and three reverse gears. The steering is done with a yoke. In the front, there are rotating seats. And now, the most impressive feat. Let's switch to the instrument-only navigation mode. Close the hatches. We're now navigating by cameras only. The drivers navigating by cameras. They are placed all around the vehicle, allowing for forward, rear, and side visibility. Look how fast the book is moving. We definitely thought this was rather extreme driving, but the driver was perfectly at ease. Confidently taking us to our primary position. We've just heard the Ready 5 alert. Let's see our situation. We are positioned about a thousand feet from the nearest two launchers. Any moment now, the target drone will be launched. This is how the crew prepare for it. This side, communications with the command post, here, the driver. The target will be at a safe range, so the hatches are left open. Now, we wait. Working against us today, the Saman target drones. But what are the capabilities of these drones we first heard of at the Kavkaz 2020 exercise? This is a converted OSA SAM, which can imitate a small-sized high-speed target. Is it closer to a cruise missile or a fighter? It depends on the trajectory I program in before firing. We can simulate a cruise missile or elements of high-precision weapons, which is important these days. So with the Saman, we can test against a cruise missile, a guided missile, or even a guided bomb? Depending on the chosen trajectory, we can create a target at 1,500 to 23,000 feet. The trajectory and the altitude are programmed in, and the Saman is launched. The launch is immediately registered at the command post. Launched. Tracking. And a few moments later, the target is detected by the Telar operators. Acquired. Tracking. Second acquired. Tracking. Today, it's like an exam for them. If the missile's detected and intercepted, it's a pass. If they fail, well, then it's a fail. No second tries here. We're seeing the erectors rising. We've just heard the tracking call, and this means that... There they go. Two book missiles are rising into the skies. We'll have to wait while they reach the target and eliminate it. Rocket. 
This is how the launches looked on the action cameras we placed near the book. This footage shows the launches of the previous M2 version book. Unlike them, the M3, as all systems with the ADF, fire from a vertical position. This is a feature of all Russian new-gen air defense systems. The S-400 Triumph, the S-350 Vityaz, and the Buk M3. This allows them to launch against targets coming from any direction. For comparison, the American Patriot, the system they are so proud of, cannot boast this 90-degree launch capability. Some say this was one of the reasons it failed to prevent the attack on the Saudi Arabian oil refinery. Be as it may, we will not get into it. Let's return to Cap Houston Yar. Here at the command post, they've already registered a score of hits. Hit registered. We should add that the Saman is not just a simple projectile. It is a precision weapon, a guided missile capable of changing speed, altitude, and trajectory. It can also approach from the front or the rear. The best thing is the crew react to winning this competition just the same as when Russian team wins in sports. Hooray! Go Russia! The question is, if this is so easy, how could the drones in Nagorno-Karabakh be so devastatingly successful? Again, we won't discuss whose drones they were. Just why was there no parity in those skies? Why could no one stop the terrible attack? In the absence of a robust, well-organized air defense, with no last-gen systems like those in service with the Russian armed forces, the army there just couldn't ensure air superiority. As Zhukov used to say, the country that can't defend against attacks from the air is doomed. So we saw that a probably well-trained ground forces unit just didn't have any air cover. After you've seen this footage, do you still think that the Russians are protected from such attacks? Yes, we are protected. The situation's the same at the ADF. Any possible type of air attack is covered. Case in point, another simulated scenario, similar to the attack on the Saudi Arabian oil refinery. It's peacetime, so there is no clear enemy. But here there are terrorists, quite well-armed terrorists. These bad guys are also preparing a massed missile strike, in this case on a nuclear power plant, from ship and aircraft drones. They begin. As soon as the missiles enter the air defense zone, they are detected by the radars of the radio technical troops. They immediately transmit the data to the air defense system covering the airspace, in this case, the TOR. The attack continues. The missiles are going low to the ground, so they are harder to detect. This particular situation is resembling the attack on the Shairat airbase in Syria, which was shelled by the American Tomahawk missiles. So, how does the computer decide which missiles are most dangerous, which ones should be hit first? The computer prioritizes targets that constitute higher threat or have a lower approach time. You mean it can tell that one missile is going to be in the air defense zone in one minute, the others in two, and fires on the first one? It assigns numbers to targets based on their threat level. The operator makes the call which one to fire against. So the computer shows which one to hit, and the person can agree? Or disagree, yes. In this simulation, the Tor battery first takes care of the ship-launched Tomahawks. Then the aircraft missiles launched against the power plant are destroyed. And finally, it's time for the missiles launched by the drones. 
Only after that do they bring down the main culprit, the drone. If I understand correctly, in a similar to Nagorno-Karabakh situation, you would have two simultaneous objectives, to neutralize the drone on one hand and to counter the missiles on the other. Well, air defense isn't limited to just the ADT actions. It's an operation in which a large part is played by the EW troops and the aviation. So you may get better results with just powerful ECM jamming than with massed fire? Yes. Disabling launch vehicles, or even before that, command centers using obscurance to hamper high-precision weapons guidance systems, which are usually laser-based. On Combat Approved, we've already covered drone electronic countermeasures. Drone targets don't pose much of a challenge, as this footage proves. This is all that was left of the Turkish Bayraktar after it entered into the EWT-controlled airspace. The drone that everybody had thought invulnerable. The drone that had directed the missile strikes we saw at the beginning of the episode. So what anti-drone weapons does Russia possess? Specialized rifles is one. Net drones is two. Interceptor drones is three. But most importantly, the electronic warfare systems. Their jamming capabilities have proven more effective than the previous three weapons combined. The method of jamming is carefully researched and tested. And in fact, the method and range of jamming are the key to developing the most energy-efficient capable device. This is how we're able to produce competitive equipment. The effectiveness of this anti-drone arsenal has been amply demonstrated during the 2018 FIFA World Cup. Not a single drone incident. The interceptions, however, were quite numerous. This is the data from just one of the anti-drone contractors. How many drones has your company intercepted, approximately? Well, approximately, I can say that it's more than a hundred. More than a hundred. And that's just the intercepted drones. The number of drones detected and neutralized is much higher. This diagram shows us the movements of the drone the distance to it and its trajectory. The interesting point is where this technology is currently used. Within the AFSIN structures. In prisons, in short. Yes, it's often used against drones trying to smuggle in drugs, mobile phones, and other restricted items. This episode, however, is about air defense, not electronic warfare. So let's get back to the ways of dealing with drones using the ADMS. We once launched our drone to test the Pantsir, and it demolished the drone with its guns. In Syria, the Pantsir protecting the Khmiman air base against drone strikes sometimes had to fire missiles. But those missiles weren't cheap, so the designers came up with a cheaper version, purpose-built as an anti-drone missile. These were first shown during the 2020 Victory Day Parade. Show, don't tell, as they say. Let's show the new missiles. Up we go, here they are. Four small missiles. This version is called the Pontsir SM. Compared to the original Pontsir, the primary missiles here are more powerful to better defend against attacks similar to the Nagorno-Karabakh ones. Look, do you see? These missiles are larger than those ones. Larger in diameter? Exactly, and that's important. Its larger size means larger range, so the range is vastly increased compared to the previous version. 
and we can still launch those old missiles from here, so it can work with mixed ammunitions. And considering that it can be loaded manually, it makes it incredibly flexible during combat. Today, Russia is widely regarded as a world leader in air defense, and this is nothing new. The Soviet Rus-1, the first ever air defense radar, was put into service way back in 1938. The U.S. caught up only a year later. During the Second World War, air defense was provided by barrage balloons and anti-aircraft guns. However, the advent of jets forced the whole world to change its approach to air defense. So after the war, a ring of the S-25 Berkut ADMS was created around Moscow. Later, they were upgraded to the S-75. They were capable of intercepting targets flying at Mach 3, a record at the time. But soon they too needed to be replaced. The fact was that these systems took hours to get battle ready, and it was vital then to get the time down to five minutes. And so the legendary Kub was developed, the system which earned abroad a reputation as the slayer of high-speed mirages and falcons. Soon after, the Kub was replaced by the familiar book. As with any weapon, the ADMS are constantly upgraded, but the potential enemies are also playing the game. They are always looking for the smallest cracks in the sky shield. To keep this shield strong, you always have to be one step ahead. That's why there are such top-secret institutions as the Tver-based Central Research Institute of the Aerospace Forces. The hangar we're entering now houses a unique collection. I don't believe there's any such collection anywhere else in Russia, or anywhere else in the world, in fact. It comprises scale models of all NATO aircraft and missiles. And some real-size ones. For example, this one, right? Correct. What is it? This is a real-size hypersonic missile developed by DARPA. DARPA, the research organization developing the latest technologies? Yes, the agency developing emerging technologies for the U.S. military. So this is a missile currently in service with the U.S. military? Not yet. This is their testing prototype. The latest NATO missiles, stealth aircraft, helicopters, drones, they get here in various ways. Some are obtained by intelligence. Some come straight from the battlefield. The same way the police maintain a fingerprint database, the CRI professors maintain an aircraft database. Each of them has their own unique radar signature, which has to be identified here. With this approach, no aircraft can be truly undetectable. By lifting this missile up, what are we trying to achieve? We need to test how it reflects across the entire wavelength spectrum, from millimeter to meter waves. So, worst case scenario, these missiles, God forbid, fly toward us. Will this help us immediately identify it? No, this will tell us now at what distance it will be detected and destroyed. To achieve this kind of precise forecast, each missile each aircraft or its model is mounted on a special rig and rotated around its axis. And dozens of different types of radars simultaneously monitor the object. With this setup, we're simulating the missile in flight? No, we're simulating different angles of monitoring. Right. We can't predict the missile to radar angle. Exactly. We're establishing the signal for any and all angles. I see. Well, shall we? Go. The result of this research is lines like these, which are a unique radar signature diagram, which is almost like a fingerprint. There are hundreds of such diagrams here. Here's just a small set from the archive. This is the Corsair II carrier-based attack aircraft. This is the EF-111 electronic warfare aircraft. Next to it is the Tomcat carrier-based fighter. We are not allowed to show modern aircraft diagrams. Let's just say this is a database of anything that can come from the air.
that means that the file cabinets of the CRI also contain the signature diagrams of the Turkish Bayraktar drone and the Israeli Harab. The ones that were so terrifying in Nagorno-Karabakh. Russian military are not afraid of those. The air defense doctrine stipulates echelon detection, beating the enemy at high altitudes and long ranges, and then scaling up activity at lower altitudes and at lower ranges. The existing air defense armaments, including the S-300V4, Buk M3, Tor M2, Verba and Tunguska, make it possible to guarantee beating any enemy at altitudes from 30 to 100,000 feet and at ranges from 1,500 feet to 250 miles. So forget the knife. To this gunfight, we're coming not just with one gun, but with a whole lot of ADMSs, right? Yes. The head of the ADT training center mentioned only the ADT systems. But as we said, there are also the Aerospace Defense Forces. Put together, it's an incredibly powerful air defense shield. The S-400 long-range systems is one. Electronic warfare armament is two. Air defense aviation is three. Next, medium range air defense systems, the S-350 Vityaz, S-300V4, Buk M3, and Viking. That's four. Next are the masters of close range, at 20 kilometers, the Pantsir and the Tor. That's five. Sixth is the closest layer, a kind of aerial bayonet combat. This is the domain of the Tunguska ADMGS with its rapid-fire machine guns, and also the Igla and Verba monopods. And so the Russian skies are covered at all ranges and all altitudes. More than that, they can effectively cover any facilities abroad. The strength of the Russian air defense is that it is comprehensive. Few countries can boast their own air defense systems, missile manufacturers, testing ranges, research facilities, and scientists to run them. And Russia has them all. To paraphrase Suvorov, who said, we are Russians and God is on our side, I will say, we are Russians and the heavenly forces are on our side. The air defense troops of the ground forces and the aerospace defense forces.